Okay. Well, I think everyone's getting situated here, so I think we'll go ahead and get things officially started and rolling. Uh, I'd like to first of all welcome everyone here today to the second annual Academic High Altitude Conference. It's an honor to, to have everyone here in ISU. We're blessed to have a wonderful campus here and also uh, Ames is a great community, so I, I hope everyone enjoys your stay here and enjoys the conference. I have a few announcements and uh, a, a short little presentation that uh, I'll, I'll do, and then we will immediately go to our keynote speaker. Um, just a few things to take care of for the conference for the next couple of days. Um, first of all, I want to give a few thank yous. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Taylor University. Uh, and especially Sue Gavin over there, she has been instrumental in helping us. Uh, in addition, I'd like to also thank uh, the rest of the uh, committee people that we had in planning this conference. Uh, most of them are my students over here. Uh, Ethan Harstead, which is over in the corner, uh, he did all of our web development. Uh, Christopher Rice, uh, who is also in charge of our CubeSat program. And Christine Jensen, who actually runs our high altitude balloon program here as well. Okay. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Iowa State University and the conference planning and, and management team, uh, the, my department, the Aerospace Engineering Department. I'd like to also give a big thank you to the Iowa Space Grant Consortium for helping out with the posters and with the uh, uh, competition money for that. Uh, and last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank my wife, Jennifer, who has put up with me through this entire ordeal. So, uh, If you haven't already, uh, please uh, uh, make sure you get everything registered, get your name tags, uh, the proceedings and everything with that. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll have, uh, uh, also make sure that you get your parking pass as well. Uh, ISU is a bit of a stickler on parking on campus, so uh, make sure you get your parking pass if you have any questions, uh, the registration booth, uh, myself, or any of my students will be happy to answer any questions that you have for that. Uh, a clarification on meals. Uh, there is no formal meal for this evening. Instead, we will have some appetizers. That will be uh, downstairs. Uh, and also, please stick around for the posters that will be down there. Um, the Iowa Space Grant Consortium uh, we'll be doing some judging, and there'll be a short presentation and announcement of the winners for that uh, this evening as well. Um, let's see, we've got meals on Thursday and Friday. We will have a continental breakfast. I think there was an email that was sent out uh, that wasn't too clear on that. But there will be a continental breakfast here in the morning on both Thursday and Friday morning. We'll have catered lunch on Thursday, catered dinner on Friday, and then another catered lunch on Friday, and that is actually the cafe, and you're in for a treat with that one, so uh, hopefully you enjoy that. The uh, balloon launch uh, that we had hoped to do, uh, typical Iowa, uh, we have not had good weather, and so uh, we were hoping to do a flight uh, tomorrow, uh, actually we're also hoping to do a flight on Tuesday for the workshop folks and we weren't able to do that. However, Friday morning is looking gorgeous. So cross your fingers, we'll have good weather Friday morning, and that will be at 8 a.m. just north of uh, Howe Hall here. Uh, we will be flying a payload that my students have worked on. We will also be flying one of the data loggers that was made at the workshop as well. So uh, we'll, we're looking forward to that as well. There will be two forums on Friday afternoon if you're able to stick around. Um, first of all, as a general announcement, uh, Treveca has agreed to take over for the conference for next year. So the 2012 Academic High Altitude Conference will be in Treveca. And uh, the committee meeting for that will be on Friday afternoon. If you are interested and can't make it, there are also some sign-up sheets by the registration. And that also goes for, uh, we talked about this last year, about forming a national chapter for high altitude uh, work or ballooning. And uh, that meeting is also going to be held Friday afternoon. And again, if you can't make that and you're still interested in serving on that committee, 
uh, we'll have some sign-up sheets because we want to try to get as many people involved as we can for that. So please pay attention to that. And, and again, if you have any questions, you can come and see me later. So, okay. Uh, one of the nice things about uh, doing the conference here at Iowa State is we get to brag a little bit. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about our program here at Iowa State. And then uh, we will get uh, to our keynote speaker. Iowa State has done high altitude ballooning for quite a while, uh, and since 1995. And we were originally funded through the Iowa Space Grant Consortium. Uh, we're now supported under the Aerospace Engineering Department. And we've, we've had the pleasure of doing a, a number of flights, and we've had great students that have been working on this. And so, it's one of the reasons why we're very happy to, to have everyone here uh, with us this week. Just a, a few things about what we have done uh, so far. We've done over 120 different missions uh, within our flights, and most of those missions have had multiple flights underneath them. So we've, we've had about 140 flights. We had one mission that I th we, we do numbering or uh, lettering for each of the missions. Uh, or for each of the flights, and uh, I think we got up to N on one of them, so we had, we had quite a bit. So uh, We currently have an altitude record of 121,793 feet. Obviously not the record, although we keep trying for that. So We have a very good recovery rate. We have a 98% recovery rate with that, and a 100% safety record. We've been very good about following our procedures, and because of that, uh, we have no students that have been harmed uh, in any of the flights that we've done. We've done no property damage. Uh, we haven't hit any aircraft. Uh, so uh, cross to figure we'll, we'll continue that, that safety record for that as well. One of the things that is actually changing here uh, is the new program that will be starting uh, within my department. And that's this new Make to Innovate program that we have going on. And it's designed to help engage our students into the design projects from freshmen all the way up to seniors. And what's really neat about this is that our high altitude balloon program is going to be one of our key programs that's going to be instrumental in this new uh, uh, program that we'll be starting up here. And so we're really excited about this. And if you get a chance, uh, feel free to come to me or any of the students. We'll be happy to take you through some of the labs and stuff because we're really excited about where things are going to be moving on from here. OK, so that's my little soapbox for, for our program here. Uh, I want to, before we get into the keynote, I want to leave you guys with a few things I just kind of want you to think about uh, through uh, the next couple days with the conference. One of the things, and why I have this little chart up here, is that we have seen really a, a growth in high altitude ballooning and how it's being used, both not only at the university level, but in the K through 12 level, and even in uh, the amateur, uh, both amateur radio and, and other groups that have been doing this as well. And this is a Google Trends that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, this is basically showing uh, weather balloon searches. And a lot of the news items that were popping up with these searches were related to either universities or K through 12 schools that were uh, you know, basically launching a high altitude balloon. And you can kind of see, especially after 2009, now we, we definitely had a, a big blip there. Well, I'm sure a lot of you remember the, the dad that did the little story about his son going into the balloon. Yeah, that, that's what that blip was. <laughs> Uh, so, but if you look at the general trend in, in general there, you can definitely see high altitude ballooning is getting to be more and more popular. And, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons why even like this conference here is a great thing to have because, uh, you know, more and more of us are wanting to do it. And it is a good reason for that. And, and it, it's perfect for STEM type of learning. Um, uh, exercises for students. So whether it's K through 12 or university level, it's, 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 there's a reason why we're starting to see this trend here. So ponder some of these things as you're going through the conference. And if, especially if you can make it to the Friday open forums that we have, uh, these are some of the questions I'm going to re-ask again. You know, and almost all of us here are academic institutions. We're here for academia. 
So how is it that we can help our fellow colleges and universities in, in doing these? You know, some of us have done these for a number of years. We've done a number of fights. Others have not, and they're very interested. And we want to be able to enable those groups to start, and not only start, but be successful and sustainable as well. You know, not just do a, a balloon flight and say, hey, we did a balloon flight, eh, okay, and then it drops off. Um, this is something that, that groups can use year and year and year after again. Same thing for K through 12 as well. You know, these are our future students. And recently, President Obama talked about how we need to have more STEM in, in our schools. And that's exactly right, because a lot of our future is going to be in the science, the technology, the engineering, and the math. And, and again, high altitude ballooning can help bring these to the students. Um, in addition to that, though, we also need to look at how we can help educate the public. Uh, because we've had a few black eyes in there. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen. You know, we don't want the FAA to, you know, say, well, maybe you guys shouldn't fly or anything like that. So keep thinking about some of these things as you go through the conference. And again, we're going to be tackling some of these uh, on Friday. Don uh, is also going to be here, and uh, during the Thursday lunch, we're also going to talk a little bit about that as well. So we're going to kind of keep this theme going uh, through the conference. Okay. So uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. David Pierce. He is the chief of NASA Balloon Program uh, over in the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center at the Wallops Flight Facility. That's a mouthful. Uh, as well as the Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility located in Palestine, Texas. Uh, Mr. Pierce received a BS degree in aerospace engineering from North Carolina State University in Rolla, and his MS degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Virginia. He received the NASA, NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal in 2005, the GSFC Customer Service Award in 2001, and the NASA Distinguished Service Medal in 1997. Please help me welcome Mr. David Pierce. Thanks a lot, Thank Matt. You. Yep. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Pierce, and uh, I, uh, I want to thank Matt for inviting me to come and speak. And I'm even happier that Matt said that if you speak, you don't have to do a paper. So, uh, so thank you very much, Matt. And I want to thank everybody uh, who helped me get set up, uh, Paul and Chris, for getting me set up with my presentation. Um, but it's my pleasure to be here. It's my honor to speak about the NASA Balloon Program at the Academic High Altitude Conference here at Iowa State University. And uh, boy, I, that was some awesome stuff you were talking about, Matt. I, the Make to Innovate Program and, and STEM. As a father of uh, high school kids, um, who uh, need more hands-on. I, I can tell you, it, it hits close to home for me, wanting to see them do hands-on stuff with uh, balloons. So uh, I'll get on with the, 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 the story. I want, Matt asked me to tell you a little bit about um, what we do in the NASA balloon program. And if you have questions, just stop me along the way. Um, we uh, have a customer of ours in the, the, the gallery uh, the audience, Greg Guzik, has flown with us for years and years, so if I stray too far, Greg will, you know, write me very quickly. And uh, so anyway, I'll just get on with it. Um, we, we do three things with the NASA balloon program charged by Congress. Our number one uh, is to provide low-cost, near-space access for cutting-edge science investigations. So then the number one job we have is to support universities, uh, throughout the country uh, and NASA field centers in supporting balloon flights and, and, and supporting scientists. Um, we also serve as a technology test bed for technologies that will one day become part of a spacecraft. Uh, that's the second part of our job. But last but certainly not least, probably the most important, is to serve as a training ground for young scientists and engineers. Okay? And uh, what you'll see is that um, we have a lot to celebrate in terms of ballooning at this time. Uh, just this past weekend on the mall in uh, Washington, um, they did a reenactment of Thaddeus Lowe's uh, balloon tethered uh, aerostat. Uh, it was 150 years ago that Thaddeus Lowe caught 
uh, Abraham Lincoln cruising across the mall out in front of the Smithsonian building and told him, hey, you know, we could fly balloons in support of uh, war efforts. And that began uh, with uh, the president writing uh, um, General Scott and that little post-it note over there on an index card on the upper right-hand side saying, General Scott, will you once again go and talk to Mr. Lowe about his balloons? And as you know, he uh, supported the Union with uh, doing uh, aerial surveillance of uh, Confederate troop placements during the uh, Civil War. And then, of course, went to California, and uh, that's who the Lowe Observatory is named after in uh, Pasadena. Also, we have to celebrate, it's uh, coming up on the 100th anniversary of scientific discovery with balloons. It was in 1912 that Victor Hess uh, discovered cosmic rays with an electroscope on board the balloon gondola. He got up to about 17,000 feet, and um, of course he received the uh, Nobel Prize in Physics in 1936 for his work. And we've been following in uh, uh, Victor Hess's footsteps ever since. Cosmic rays is a big part of what NASA supports, and astrophysics um, with NASA balloons. So uh, we're really proud of that tradition, and we're uh, hoping to fly a cosmic ray payload within the next year, and hopefully fly it for a really long time uh, in honor of this anniversary. Ballooning's produced some really important science um, from uh, boomerang and maxima flights that map the cosmic microwave background uh, in and around the time of the COBE uh, spacecraft mission. The results confirm the inflation model that, uh, you know, that the Big Bang, uh, it was definitely uh, a, a fact of the theory that uh, the, um, the, the inflation model and how the universe expanded was uh, confirmed by these balloon flights. Um, also, the fact that um, we, we had early detection of gamma rays, uh, positrons, uh, emissions from the galaxy, and uh, black holes were first detected on balloons. And as you may well know, balloons were f the first platform to uh, confirm the existence of the CFC ozone depletion theory in Antarctica. It's confirming that the ozone hole existed. So balloons have done really important science, and they'll continue to do really important science. They've been in the media a lot lately, uh, not least of which was uh, uh, John Wafel and Greg Guzik's attic mission was featured in Nature for possibly indirect measurement of dark matter in 2008. And that really was, was the big story in 2008. It was on the front page of the New York Times science section there on the little lower left-hand corner. Uh, Mark Devlin in the BLAST mission just flew, and they were on the cover of uh, Astronomy um, at Sky and Telescope magazine last month. And um, uh, we've had a number of uh, super pressure balloon articles on the uh, development of this new balloon. Uh, over the last few years in nature. This is not your father's balloon program any longer. These payloads have gotten big, and they've gotten really sophisticated, and they've gotten really expensive. A uh, typical payload today is on the order of six to $10 million, and they weigh on the order of about 4,000 pounds to 5,000 pounds. Um, we have a few that are up around 6,000 pounds. Um, there you see just a, an assortment of the sophisticated astrophysics payloads that we're currently flying in the program. In addition, balloons have contributed in essential ways to scientific spacecraft missions. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting to look at the instruments that have flown on balloons that then went and became part of Explorer spacecraft missions. Um, we've tracked over 30 spacecraft in the last four decades that the instruments first flew on balloons. There's other missions where the instruments flew on sounding rockets, but certainly suborbital is a really important test bed for developing that technology. We like to say it's, it's AAA ball, but it's really, really good AAA ball. Um, you can look at most of the Explorer missions and the observatories that NASA's flown in the last 15 years. Those missions started as graduate students and research PIs flying a payload on a balloon first. It's also critical to developing scientists. I wanted to just highlight a couple. Um, you may know John Grunsfeld is the astronaut who's done most of the um, Hubble servicing missions. He's the, been the astronaut that's had the most EVAs going out and repairing 
uh, and upgrading the uh, Hubble. He states in his uh, opinion that uh, his career as a scientist was based on the foundation he got as a student uh, working in balloons. That's where he learned to build tools that were specific to the needs of the mission. It taught him to have hands-on activities and think outside the box, and it taught him how to deal with failure, how to learn from his mistakes, go back and fix it, fly it again. And that's everything that we all do together as a community is we learn every time we fly one of these flights, we learn something that we didn't know before. And uh, he says that, that it's been quintessential uh, that to his scientific experience, going from concept, hardware, observation, and scientific analysis. That's the beauty of um, what we do, is, is that it works in a time scale that students can make a, an authentic contribution to the mission and do it in a time frame that they can graduate with. And we're really proud to be a part of that. I'd also like to highlight many scientists in, with leading roles in NASA now are trained in the balloon program, two of which are John Mather and George Smoot, both who received the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2006. John Mather, of course, is the only NASA scientist that's received the Nobel Prize. Um, Tom Prince is uh, the NASA mission scientist for LISA out at Caltech, and he was also a graduate student at Once Upon a Time, started out doing work on balloons. Now, I just wanted to go through the Mather experience a little bit. You can Google John. And John, as an undergraduate, went to Swarthmore. But then he went from there to Berkeley. And he started working as a graduate student under Paul Richards. And he started to look at measuring the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, it, and, and at that time, what he says is it was a very faint echo of the Big Bang itself. And they could barely detect it. I thought this was also great because you may have this experience in, in your own uh, work. Was, he said, it was a rare day when I really felt I knew what I was doing. I, I felt like that for years and years in my capacity, working with scientists and trying to get the job done. The first flight of a balloon payload was a failure for three different reasons. Not the, the, the third reason that he, he writes about in his book, First Light, was is that they wanted to fly so badly that even though they weren't sure it was, it was absolutely ready to fly, they put it on a truck and they took it to Palestine because they really wanted to fly. They had launch fever. That happens with us all the time, okay? So it's, it's natural. Um, of course, as he pointed out, nature's final exams are a lot less organized and, and, and unforgiving as well when it doesn't work. So we all learn from this. This is, I think this is a great example through Mather showing us that what he's done is what we're doing. And what you're doing is just as important as what Mather did. Um, there in the lower right-hand corner just shows you a schematic drawing of his payload and how they were basing it on Mickelson's Nobel Prize for Instrumentation in 1907. Here's an interesting picture. Here's a picture of the Kobe team. So, so John Mather got his PhD based on the second flight that worked. And then he became the PI for the uh, uh, Cosmic uh, Background Explorer mission. And there you see a picture with the science team with all the balloon scientists identified. The point here is to get to the big leagues, you got to go through the minor leagues. And the best way to play ball in the minor leagues is with balloons. What you're learning and doing with balloons is so important to the future of the country. It's amazing. But that gave them all that experience so that they could go off and build COBE. COBE satellite, of course, had its issues where it got built and then they were trying to find a ride. It was supposed to go on shuttle and, and after the Challenger, it, it sat in hiatus, but it finally got launched. And COBE's data was the best at the date. But uh, even as they were working toward uh, launching COBE, um, CMB flights were continuing on balloons and laid the groundwork for the next Explorer mission for the Cosmic Microwave Background called MAP. And then it was renamed after Wilkinson called WMAP. And there you see the full sky map of uh, MAP made and how much more improved than COBE it was at the time that it launched in the uh, late 90s. Here's a picture of Paul Richard uh, donating uh, their payload, Mather's payload, to the Air and Space Museum. So it starts out as humble beginnings and now it's in the, space, uh, or in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. 
And of course, here's a picture of John and George Smoot uh, at the uh, Nobel Prize reception in 2006 for their discovery of black body form and anastropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And least but not, I mean, but not least is the fact that they got a TV show out of it. And uh, it's, a, it's a hit show amongst a lot of folks. And there's George Smoot on uh, Big Bang Theory um, a number of years ago. So it's, uh, it's had that, we, we can at least say Balloons started a, a hit TV show for geeks. Um, anyway, uh, but uh, in summary, it's all about doing great science, but it's also about developing scientists and engineers. Um, we're really proud of the role that we play in balloons of giving folks hands-on experience when they're students, giving them a chance to work in an environment, make an authentic contribution, give them a chance that if they make a, 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 a mistake or things don't go well, it's not career limiting, they can really um, stretch. One of the ways that we do this now is working with Greg Guzik and, and John Wafel. Since 2004, we've been supporting what uh, Greg will talk to you about um, at another time called, the, uh, later in the conference, the High Altitude Student Platform. And we're really proud of this. And uh, I won't talk much about it because Greg's going to give you an overview of it. But we're really proud to be able to fly up to 12 payloads every year fly uh, above 20 hours, hopefully closer to 30 hours, um, uh, but typically they're on the order of 12 to 20 hour flights. And um, it gives students a hands-on training experience to build their payload and fly it. And we, we intend to do this more and more in the future. Uh, so we're really proud of that relationship that we have with the Louisiana Space Grant in service to the country. So if you're interested in flying on this, we have an annual call and we invite you to uh, sign up and participate. In general, our program provides hand, hands-on training uh, through our 15 or so launches that we do a year um, involving 23 universities, about 50 lead scientists, about 26 graduate students, and, and over 100 undergraduate students a year. In addition to uh, working with students, we, we also are looking to increase and extend the technology and the capability of balloons. Um, as you know, Otto Winsen was the innovator of the balloon that we currently fly that designs about 60 years old. He left General Mills in 49 and started Winsen Research. And we're still working with the, uh, the, the next company from Winsen that bought out Winsen called Raven Industries who build the finest balloons in the country or in the world. Um, our, our standard design zero pressure balloons are based upon Winson's design. And we're looking to try to extend that. Um, our balloons at, at launch are about three football fields long when we laid them out. And um, roughly speaking, they're bigger than the Houston Astrodome when they're at float. They're rather large structures. We've been doing modifications to the ducts, the zero pressure balloons. We've uh, looked at modifying and uh, improving how the uh, ducts are attached. We uh, don't fly horsetail ducts any longer. We, we tend to fly the uh, attached ducts because we found that they were more reliable. The balloon system is pretty standard from what we've been flying over a number of years, but we've been working to increase the reliability of all these systems from the uh, terminate fitting between the balloon and the parachute to the uh, pointing system, the uh, data rate uh, going uh, upwards of uh, 300 kilobits per second, but trying to increase that um, over the horizon above 100 kilobits per second, um, and also providing reliable computers and data systems and power systems to our customers. Our workhorse balloon is the uh, 40 million cubic foot balloon. It uh, carries about 6,000 pounds. That would be about 4,000 pounds of science payload to about 127,000 feet. What we've noticed is our zero pressure balloons droop a, a fair amount uh, due to uh, uh, the diurnal effect overnight. Um, these are test results for uh, the 34 Heavy. And it drooped about, you know, varied on the order of plus or minus seven kilometers. 
And this is one of the issues that we've been working with in the program to try to develop a balloon that would float at a constant density altitude. We launched from Texas and New Mexico and the states, and we launched from Sweden, Australia, and Antarctica outside the United States. We uh, alternate going to Sweden or Australia every other year, but we go to Antarctica every year. Over the last few years, we used to fly in the early 90s, we were flying about 30 flights a year, um, but they were a much shorter duration. We're flying on the order of 15 flights a year, and we're looking to try to get that up to around 20 flights per year. Um, we typically support all the science disciplines out there, both space science and earth science. And our flights are mixed across the campaigns where we act uh, or where we deploy to. Um, but uh, our main focus has been Antarctica over the last few years. We used to fly, when we started Antarctica, we'd fly two flights a year. And now we regularly fly three large payloads every year from Antarctica. We are also flying more flights from S-Range Sweden. That gives us about a four-day, five-day flight from Sweden to uh, Canada. And uh, we fly in Fort Sumner, New Mexico in the fall every year. And we're going to fly about nine flights there this uh, August and September, two of which will be a HASP student flights. We've, uh, the success of the polar long duration balloon flights uh, from Antarctica have been our biggest success in recent years. Um, we've been flying in Antarctica since 91. Um, we started flying fairly short flights on the order of eight to 20 days. Over the last several uh, years, since uh, 2004, that duration has dramatically increased. Uh, we flew a uh, record-breaking 42-day flight with a zero-pressure balloon in 2004. We flew a super-pressure balloon test flight of 54 days, demonstrating that we can fly ultra-long duration flights. We've flown from Fairbanks to Canada, uh, over um, Russia and back to Canada twice and uh, we've had flights from Kirina, Sweden to Canada. But because we don't have an overflight agreement with Russia, that limits the duration of those flights. So you, there's no reason why you couldn't fly as long in the northern hemisphere as we do in Antarctica, aside from the fact that we don't have overflight permission with Russia. So our focus has been on increasing the duration of these flights in Antarctica. With that, you see the average float hours per flight has dramatically increased. Um, up to now where we're, we're flying a couple hundred hours per flight on average uh, across the 15 flights that we're flying because we're flying more of these LDB flights. The Antarctica campaign this coming year will have three missions. Um, EBEX, which is a cosmic microwave background mission. CREST, which is a cosmic ray mission. And for the first time, we're going to be supporting a science mission with the super pressure balloon. So this is a combination test flight and science mission. This is really significant because this is the first time that NASA will demonstrate supporting one of these large science missions with the super pressure balloon. And then that will make it eligible to start supporting science on a regular basis. OK, I mentioned that. OK, so the story starts here. I'll just walk you a little bit through how it works. Um, we'll start the story at the end of the story, which is uh, we, we recover the payload. Um, the science payload gets shipped from Antarctica back to the university, and the, the graduate students and undergraduate students start to refurbish the payload. They repair it, put it back together, they calibrate it, and after they finish calibrating it, they ship it. They send it to the next stop, which is uh, Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility in Palestine, Texas. There it goes through integration and test. It's integrated with our flight support systems at NASA. It's taken outside, and they, we flow data end-to-end, -end, and we do what we call a compatibility hang test. There we make sure it's ready for flight. After that, we ship it. In this case, we'll ship it to Antarctica. Um, we ship it, and we put it in a payload building, and there the team assembles it for its final time and calibrates it and gets it checked out and ready to go. There's a picture of uh, the launch site. After it's integrated, we take it outside and we do another hang test. We do another compatibility test. 
where we flow data through the TDRA satellites. We do a complete end-to-end -end where we talk to the payload. The payload talks to the control center in Texas. And once we know that we don't um, uh, interfere with the science mission and are interfering with any of their telemetry or their, um, their, their computer systems or their electronics and they don't interfere with NASA's, we declare that we're flight ready and we wait for weather. Here's a picture of launch day for the attic payload. I think this was in 2007, maybe. Okay, Chris, if you'll. This is a, a video showing you a launch. Of course, there was the launch vehicle with the payload. Here's what you're seeing is the parachute. There's the canopy of the parachute. And about where that uh, snowmobile is is where the balloon starts. It just goes on and on. Okay, it's held down by a spool, and it's inflated from uh, two places um, in the balloon uh, near the, the top of the bubble with helium. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes to inflate the balloon. They tie that off, and then they'll release the balloon from the spool. What we do is we have a collar on the balloon up here. It's like a girdle with bungee cord and some pyrotechnics. That way, this whole balloon doesn't become a huge spool, uh, uh, parasail over the top when it comes up and tears itself up. We uh, move the launch vehicle to get the payload right underneath the balloon, and then we release the, balloon, I mean, the payload from the uh, launch vehicle. And then we send a signal to, for the uh, collar, or the, the girdle, to come off the balloon, and then it begins its flight. Next, Chris. While in flight, we, we track it through flight operations through our uh, operational control center in uh, Palestine, Texas. We demonstrated in 2009 something we'd never been able to do before, and that is we demonstrated that we could track three payloads, uh, three balloons in flight simultaneously uh, and on different continents to demonstrate this global capability because eventually you would like to have 300-day flights operating at the same time. And uh, that, of course, is going to be a, uh, a big operational um, nightmare for the guys in Texas. So we're, we're starting to do that work and demonstrate that. We work FAA airspace coordination, communication, and all the same stuff that you guys do. We do that from our uh, control center in Texas. During our flights with a zero pressure balloon, you'll see that uh, in, in constant daylight, the uh, diurnal variation isn't as bad, but we're still varying on the order of six to, say, uh, 7,000 feet, plus or minus a day. And we would like, our science community would like to have a more stable float. Uh, this is around, uh, say, 125 to 130,000 feet. This shows you what the uh, compilation of flight trajectories over Antarctica are. Uh, between 2002 and 2007. Once that uh, vortex is set up over Antarctica, we launch from uh, about here. I can't show you. Um, from uh, McMurdo. And if we do it right, it will float, free float inside uh, that uh, vortex and float for up to 40 some days until the uh, vortex starts to break down. At the end of the flight, we send a command over the horizon by the TDRA satellite. It tears a hole uh, in the balloon. The balloon is jettisoned from the parachute, and the parachute brings the payload down. Hopefully, the payload looks like this, very nice, landing on the ice. Um, that doesn't always happen. Um, we go out with an airplane, and we uh, take the uh, payload apart, and we put it in an airplane, and we bring it back to McMurdo. The science team packs it up and it's sent back home where the story starts again. One of the benefits of the program is, is that we can fly these payloads multiple times. Some days it doesn't go so smooth. Um, in this case, we drug a payload for over 100 miles and uh, destroyed the payload. So just, just like what happens, okay, you had a bad day, something went wrong, what do we do to fix it? In this case, what we were seeing was is that the balloon 
between the uh, parachute and the balloon when we terminated the flight. Of course, the payload is um, in tension, uh, or the parachute's in tension between the lift of the balloon and the payload weight. And so when the balloon is separated from the parachute, um, the parachute becomes like a huge bungee, and the parachute's racing toward the payload, and the payload's racing toward the parachute, until the wind or the air catches the parachute. And then you have this huge shock of the uh, parachute opening. And so one, the idea that the, the folks at CSBF had is, why don't we put a parachute, um, like a parachute type material, and stitch it together, and, and, and put that as an attenuator between the balloon and the parachute, so that the parachute opens uh, or pulls away more gently. It has a, a constraint, and it's not going to race toward the payload, and then it reduces the, uh, the, the open shock load that we're seeing. Because what we, what we have is we have cables uh, that have communications going up and down the uh, parachute, and they were snapping. Um, so we had a problem that we wanted to fix. So they developed something called rip stitch. Chris, if you'll show this. This is a video showing the shock loading on the payload at termination without. So this is the before video. And you see where all those cables were just, Chris, do you mind showing that again, running that again, please? You see where the cables are all coming together and then boom. So this was quite a load, and once we started getting data on it, we realized we needed to fix this. Okay, so this is after we've implemented rip stitch, and this shows you what the uh, parachute load looks like. Go ahead, Chris. So it's holding on to that parachute a lot more gentle. So every time we've had a problem in the program, what we've tried to do is put our heads together, go visit people that know more than we do on the subject, learn about it, write up lessons learned, come up with a plan, and try something. We like to say, let's try something even if it's wrong, because we want to learn from our mistakes. Okay, so what you see there is before that we were seeing about 90-some Gs over a millisecond, okay? And then we got it down to where we were seeing five, six, seven Gs over a millisecond. And we stopped breaking those cables, and all of a sudden we were seeing communications data all the way down to the ice. So this is, this is one of the success stories when you have a problem, you go out and you put your heads together and you figure out how to make it work. Now this we call the attic money shot. In addition to, not yet Chris, in addition, let me set this up, in addition to let's reduce the loads, okay, what we wanted to do was create an automated system so that when the payload hit the ground and flipped over, had a, like an inclinometer on it, when it flipped over plus 50 degrees, pyrotechnics were going to automatically fire and the parachute was going to be uh, separated from the payload because, again, we had, we had a problem where the parachute wasn't separating, it was dragging. Part of it was we, we were breaking the cables to communicate with the system. So let's make an automated system also. So this is the suspenders, um, or the belt with, yeah, this is the suspenders. So here's the parachute bringing the attic payload down. So there's, there's separation of the cable ladder from the parachute. And we, we like to say, I mean, if we, if we'd had Hollywood do this, they'd have had to shoot this about 10 times to get it right. Look at this, and here comes the airplane. It's great. And I didn't have to call up John Wafel and tell him my drug is payload. So it, was, it, it worked out for everybody. Okay, so that's Antarctica and some of the technologies that we've been doing. We've been going to Sweden. Again, we've been flying about five day flights from Sweden to Canada. Um, in 2009, we flew probably the most sophisticated solar telescope ever built uh, by the Germans. It's called Sunrise, and uh, they're looking to come and fly next year. Uh, we just completed the campaign in Sweden, and we flew a mission called High Winds to uh, measure uh, thermospheric winds. 
That's never been done before with a balloon. So uh, we, we're really proud to be able to support scientists doing neat and new stuff. We completed the Australia campaign we started in 2010. One of the other blips that Matt was showing in 2010 on Google searches was while we were uh, conducting the Australia campaign in April of 2010, we had a bad day. Um, our safety processes, as good as they were, weren't good enough to prevent folks from coming up to a fence near the airport. And because we were trying to abort a mission, that we couldn't release, and we were trying to abort the balloon. Um, we got too close to the fence, and when we were trying to safely abort it, uh, the payload jettisoned itself from the launch crane and uh, drugged through a fence, and we almost got some folks hurt. Uh, just as Matt said, we try really hard to be safe. We don't like black eyes either. So what we did was we, we took a long, hard look at our safety processes. We improved them, and then we went back to flying uh, in December. And then we completed the campaign uh, in 2011, in, in the month of April. We flew the HERO mission that you see right there, this big telescope, looking at hard x-rays, looking at the galactic center. And they got a great flight. Uh, Brian Ramsey got a flight over 30 hours. So the story here is sometimes you have a bad day. Sometimes it doesn't go the way you want. Sometimes you learn a hard lesson, and then you keep, it, you keep going. Fort Sumner and Palestine campaigns. Um, we are not flying anything from Palestine this summer other than a couple hand launch balloons um, for uh, gamma rays. And uh, we did fly a student from Louisiana uh, who was going to be on HASP so he could graduate. So we're really proud about that. And uh, we have two HASP flights that, I, again, Greg will tell you a lot more of, but uh, we're excited about that. We're going to have two HASP flights this fall. And we're going to also do a technology mission. Um, this is a pointing uh, telescope um, that will allow, uh, from a balloon, to do exosolar, to look at planets around other suns with a sub-arc second pointing. We've never had a sub-arc second pointing system, so we're excited about that. This will be the first test flight of that. Again, um, educational student projects is a big part of the program, and we're looking forward to uh, this fall's flights with Greg. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about the, the main technology that we've been working on called the super pressure balloon. The, of course, the difference is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, zero pressure balloon varies in altitude uh, day to night. Uh, during the uh, daytime, the gas expands and is vented overboard. Overnight, we drop ballast to try to maintain altitude. But this means that you have a fairly finite life um, mid-latitude with this balloon. Uh, and the poles we can fly for 40 days because of the constant daylight that it's flying in. Uh, if you were flying from, say, Australia, you'd last about three to four days, and then you'd have to come down. You couldn't make it around uh, circumglobally from, uh, say, Australia back to um, South America, let alone go all the way around to uh, Australia. So about in the mid-'90s, the science community said, how about developing a superpressure balloon, a closed hull uh, volume that doesn't uh, vent and could take the differential pressure loads so that you could fly indefinitely? Uh, the goal of 100 days came about because that's where, how long uh, the seasonal variation is on stratospheric winds going in a certain direction is. So that's the goal. So it's been a really interesting engineering problem. They, we thought when we started that this would be very simple. Just take Otto Winsen's design, close it up, do a couple test flights, and you'll be good to go. But it's taken us 15 years, and we're still working on it. So you can tell how easy it was. Um, but again, the overarching goal is to take a ton of science to greater than 110,000 feet and fly it for up to 100 days. And then combine that with new uh, syst uh, support systems that would allow you to fly through 12 hours of darkness. In the beginning, we were looking at spherical designs. The French do spherical superpressure balloons. But we realized to be able to fly the size payloads that I showed you earlier, that the, the material can't take that stress load because of that radius. But if we cut, if we cut the balloon into all these much smaller radii, uh, of these lobes, this pumpkin shape, we could take the stress with the polyethylene material. So early on, we made a trade 
study where we, we went from the spherical design to the pumpkin. We had some early success. Be careful when you have early success. Um, we also had some challenges. Um, one of the main challenges we had was the balloon did what we called clefting. It didn't fully deploy, and we weren't exactly sure why it didn't fully deploy, but it would get out, it would, it would get up, it would almost deploy, but several lobes of the balloon, you see, are folded, and it's sort of like a baseball stitch where it just won't completely deploy. What we're worried about here is, is that this was not loaded, and then the rest of the balloon in that area was higher loaded than designed, and, and eventually, you'd have a, a reliability problem, and the balloon would just fail, just come out of the sky, and we can't have that. So this was one of the main problems we first had. We also had some early success. This is a 2 million um, uh, cubic foot balloon we flew in 2000, and it deployed beautifully. So we said, okay, let's scale up. Well, when we did that, we had problems where we either tore a hole in the balloon, it clefted, or some of the, uh, the rope, what we call the tendons, wasn't uh, properly fixed or it, uh, where we braided it uh, came apart. So we were learning stuff every day. Um, and we realized we didn't have either the computer design tools or the materials research program in place to get to where we wanted to be, even though we wanted to be successful. We started doing tests of models, going back to the future, you know, you, you have a model, you, you inflate it. So we were doing model testing, and we, so we thought we understood this, but our model, our computer design models weren't predicting this adequately. We kept building stuff, but this wasn't getting us there. Our next flight, we still had a cleft. It looked better, but it still wasn't there. Okay, Chris? Now we thought this was a good day. We launched from New Mexico, we were floating toward Albuquerque, and as you can see, um, the, balloon, the balloon looked like it deployed. And then all of a sudden, we had a seal open up. Okay, so now we were getting closer to figuring out the cleft, we thought, and, but we had material issues to where the seals, and so we had to figure out how to better heat the material to, to um, make ensure we had a reliable seal. So that was the next problem, and that was what we did in 2005. Along the way, I mean, we were always reading and, and going back and finding out what people did before us. And what we saw was is that Otto Winsen and others of the day, back in the day, they were going to airship hangars, and they were testing in a realistic environment. And how many times have we been told, you got to test in the environment you want to fly in? So that's what we started to do as well. We went and found an airship hangar in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. We put helium in it. We launched it the way we would normally launch it. We filled it out with air to simulate it rising up through the atmosphere. And lo and behold, we were able to duplicate in or reproduce in captivity this cleft that we couldn't figure out how to predict. And uh, so then we correlated our design tools with this, and then we were able to figure out um, how to make a balloon not cleft. Chris, go ahead. This took place over the course of 2007. We did about uh, six or seven tests where we would build a model of a different lobe angle, different curvature, and we would go to North Carolina and we would test it. And then we would get up in a bucket truck and we would try to figure out what the loads were. Okay, so we went from a balloon that was completely flat. We went to one constraint all the way to the kinds of lobe angles. We were flying balloons that had like lobe angles of like 120 degrees. And what we found out, we figured out was there was a natural cutoff in the, whether a balloon would cleft or not, somewhere around 90 degrees. And so then we started playing with this trade space here. Chris? Then we were worried next about how strong is it? Okay, so if we can figure out theoretically how to keep it from uh, clefting, when will the seal give out? What's, what's the differential pressure load? So then we started working on that. 
We built a balloon then. We took it to Antarctica in 2008. And we had to walk through these processes. Every time we've launched a balloon, we've learned something. But guess what? We would never taken a super pressure balloon, which is a little different animal than a zero pressure balloon, and launched it in Antarctica. So we had new equipment, new processes, et cetera. So we were learning. With the super pressure balloon, you see that, that the top package is so heavy, you have to have a, a, a tow balloon. We launched. We got our test payload, we launched it, it didn't weigh much. And there it is ascending. And voila, it got to float altitude and this is just shows the, uh, the cable going up in the balloon. But this, this balloon deployed beautifully and with no clefts. And the seals were good. Okay, so there's McMurdo and we proceeded to fly this balloon for 54 days which was a, a record. It was the longest that we'd ever flown a, a super pressure balloon of this size. Smaller balloons had been flown longer, but not anything this size. This was carrying about a 750 pound payload. And we flew it until the vortex started to break down and the balloon started to float back and it was gonna go off the, the continent and then we brought it down right there. We did not wanna put it Okay, so now I showed you the attic money shot earlier. This is what the scientists call their money shot, okay? Here is the, the altitude profile in blue of the super pressure balloon compared to balloons that were flying at the same exact time, the, the zero pressure balloons for Cream and Anita, okay? And what you'll see there is the uh, Cream and Anita balloons are varying their altitude even in constant daylight, plus or minus 6,000 feet. The super pressure balloon is varying its altitude on the order of, uh, what does it say over there? It's, uh, I guess it's about uh, 400 feet, something like that, maybe 300 feet. So it was rock solid, and that's what the scientists want. They want a nice, constant float altitude for their payload. Well, we thought we'd figured everything out. We were ready to scale up. We scaled up, and then Next thing you know, we had um, holes show up in the bottom of a balloon um, because as we tweaked the pattern, we increased the stress concentration in the base of the balloon. So every time you think you, you've got it licked, uh, you don't. Then we went to Antarctica and we, 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 we figured out the base of the balloon. We, we figured that out. We went to Antarctica for the next test flight. And in the top of the balloon, we had a yet another design stress concentration. And so this balloon, we didn't have a good day with this one either. So we went back, we, we went back to our models. One of the other things that you do when you have a bad day is make sure you recover everything, take it back and lay it out and see if you can learn. So we went out on the ice and we got everything we could of the balloon and the uh, top part of the balloon and we laid it out. And then we saw some stuff in here that we we didn't understand. It was like the balloon got shucked up near the top of the balloon. We'd never seen this before. It just, it's like it just separated. Well, we started looking. We developed everything, you know, a, a, a fishbone. In, in other words, what's everything that could have possibly happened, what mostly could have happened. We looked at the flight conditions compared to what we predicted, the actual. And then we put it back into our models that we've been developing and we noticed that we had a little stress concentration up in there. So we reinforced it. We tried to make sure that we had a continuous load path. So again, we, we, we took all of our tools, we learned something, and then we put it back into the design. This is the flight that just happened in January 2011. Chris, if you don't mind. This is just a time lapse with a uh, HD camera that shows um, the balloon is laid out down that way and it's, and it's being released now. So now you see the balloon coming up, the parachute coming up, and the, the, the HD camera is on the gondola looking straight up, obviously. And it's looking at the base of the balloon.
This was the first time we'd ever flown an HD camera and gotten back some of the data real time and then recorded the rest on board. And we just got the prettiest pictures you'd ever see of, of a balloon fully deployed. Okay, so, so the balloon deploys beautifully. It's a 14 million, so it's twice the size of the one that flew for four, 54 days. And we launched it on the very last day of our launch window. We launched it on January the 10th, basically. And we flew it for uh, 22 days. And so we brought it around one time, and then we terminated the balloon so we could go out and get it. And what we saw was, again, comparing it to the uh, blast flight, we saw again that the uh, altitude performance was wonderful. So where, where is NASA headed? Um, over the next few years, our main job right now is to complete this super pressure balloon. Um, it'll permit long duration flights at mid-latitudes. Um, what I mean by that is you could fly for 100 days looking at the galactic center. That'll open up all kinds of science that we can't currently support. Um, we'll also uh, develop um, trajectory control or modification, some means of steering the balloon so that we could avoid populated areas. That's a, that's a really tough problem, but those are the kinds of things we're working on. Most of the science payloads out there can benefit from the super pressure balloon. So we have lots of high priority science that's coming down the road that we want to support. Can you imagine flying a super pressure balloon from South America to Australia with this sub arc second pointing system? So at night, you're looking for planets around other stars with uh, balloons. It's never been done before, so we're, we're excited about that. This is the uh, arc second pointing system that I told you about earlier that we're going to do a test flight this fall in Fort Sumner. One of the operational things that we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be taking a, a, a site visit to look for a, another launch site so that we can float from South America over Australia and hopefully all the way around. But we need to make sure, as well you guys know, um, you, you, you can't overfly a large populated area. So we have to be well south of Rio, Sao Paulo. We don't want to overfly Buenos Aires or Santiago. So it's a trick for us to find something that safety will let us fly and then coordinating with the FAA or the international body. Our future looks bright for balloons. Our budget's good. Um, we have lots of missions. And we look forward to supporting Greg and HASP for the foreseeable future. Uh, we'd like to fly every state or every space grant in the, in the country on one of our balloons to, and, and their payloads. And we'd like to support more and more undergraduates with doing that. Um, we are looking to increase our balloon capabilities. We have more payloads to fly in Antarctica over the next five years than we can possibly support, so that's a good thing. And um, more missions from different disciplines wanting to fly on balloons, so this is all good. I'd just like to acknowledge um, the Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility. We can't do anything without CSBF. They make the program happen, all the fine people in Palestine. Um, and then also Airstar, Raven, in Sulphur Springs, Texas, that builds our balloons. And of course, the Antarctic LDB program couldn't happen without the National Science Foundation. They, uh, they, they handle all the logistics for us and help manage uh, Antarctica for the United States. And uh, with that, I'll uh, close it up. I'm sorry I took a little bit longer than uh, planned. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to take them.